the Lubavitcher Rebbe on the third of Tamas. What better, what better way than to come together and for brain with the Rebbe? When we go to a wedding, we are joining the bride and groom in their joy. When we go to a bris, we're participating in the babies, entering the covenant of Avraham Avinu. We go to a bar by mitzvah, we're celebrating the boy or girl who is celebrating their special day. We come to Fabrengen, it's just us and the Rebbe. I'd like to begin by welcoming everybody to this special evening as we journey through the Fabrengen. But first, I'd like to call upon Rabbi Levertov, the first shliach to the state of Arizona, the head shliach of the state of Arizona, who I am sure has received much of his direction inspiration from the many Fabrengans that he had attended by the Rebbe. It is at these Fabrengans that the Rebbe spoke to the Hasidim and shared with us the vision, his expectations, and our life's goals. So without further ado, please welcome Rabbi Leverton. Welcome everybody. There were two men who came to a Hasidic Rebbe. I don't remember the Kutzker came to the Rebbe. One was a big scholar, dedicated his life and learning and teaching. And he wrote a book. And he comes to his Rebbe to endorse his book to give a Haskama. The second person came at the same time, a simple Jew. He wrote a book too. He wrote a story book storybook about righteous people. And the Rebbe takes the book of this man, looks it over, and gives his pen to it, his name to it. And this great scholar felt a little bit slighted. He felt, here I am, studying all my life, dedicating my life to study, and this Rebbe takes the poor, plain, simple Jew. The Rebbe so it read his mind. The Rebbe told him the following. We have five books of Moses. The very first book tells us stories. And after that, we go into the books of law. That's the story of Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Jewish nation. And later we go and we're redeemed and God reveals himself at Sinai and gives us a book. So he said, why is it that God begins the Bible, the Torah, with a book of stories? And the answer is, in order to prepare ourselves, in order to be humble, in order to be able to study the Torah well, and know that this is from God. We have the stories first that teach us to have faith in the tzaddikim. When we have faith in Moses, that's when we have faith in God. But if we are lacking the faith as we read in the Torah portions in Moses, then we are lacking faith in God. I chose for tonight to share a few stories. The last time we had the legacy, memory of the Rebbe, a few people said they really wanted more stories. So I chose a few stories that will give you a 
some glimpse of the river. So the first one is, a man comes to the river and says, Rebbe, my brother has no connection to Judaism. And I'm asking for a blessing for my brother. And the Rebbe became very serious. What do you mean he has no connection? He's a Jew. He was born a Jew. He automatically has a connection. He's automatically connected with God. Sometimes there may be some dust upon somebody's heart, so you have to clear it. And then the inner soul will be revealed. But every Jew is connected to God. There are some people that do outreach work other than Chabad. And a person came to the Rebbe once and said, Rebbe, I reach out to Jews who are far and I bring them closer. And he thought the Rebbe would give him a smile, pat him on his back, and the Rebbe became serious. And he said, no Jew is far from God. Every Jew is close. Every one of us is close to God. Here it shows you in the two stories how the Rebbe viewed and looked at every, every one of us. We're all close to God. And sometimes we need to dust off some dust, but everyone has an inner neshama that is one with God. A Catholic family living in Australia, I think the name of the city is Blart, or something to that effect. Ballarat. What? Ballarat. Ballarat? Our Australian Schleifel. So this uh, Catholic family in Ballarat, Australia, had a daughter, raised her, going to church every week, and really a very good family, a good girl. And one day she goes to the library and she finds a book that the cover was black. And she opens it up and she sees stories and pictures of the Holocaust. And after reading it, taking it out from the library, bringing it home, and looking, looking, she says to herself and to her parents, how can humans act this way to kill millions of, our people, of Jewish people? The parents didn't know what to tell her. She agonized on it, but they didn't know what to tell her. One day in the paper, there was an article about the Lubavitch Rebbe, and the whole write-up about the Rebbe. So she decided, this is a Jewish spiritual leader, let me write him a letter. And she receives a letter back. And in the letter it says, there's a rabbi in Melbourne, whose name is Rabbi Gutnik. Meet up with him, and he'll be able to answer you your question. She meets up with Rabbi Gutnik. She's not satisfied with his answer. And she went into a depression. A week after they met, Rabbi Gutnik receives a letter from the Rebbe. What happened with the Jewish girl from Balaam? She's thinking to himself, Jewish girl? They tell me they're Catholic. But the Rebbe doesn't make a mistake. The Rebbe has a vision that we don't have. So he goes to the family. He speaks with the parents, with the mother. No, we're all Catholic. The girl became sick. She ended up in the hospital. So Rabbi Gutman travels to visit her in the hospital with another Rabbi Sarabransky. And the mother calls him out and says, I want to talk to you privately. I am Jewish. I was born and raised in England. And when I left and I came to Australia, I married somebody out of the faith, and I never told anyone that I am Jewish. So 
So the rabbi made him go into the hospital room where his daughter was to tell her that the larger wish. And the minute she did that, she got up and she was ready to leave the hospital. The rabbi had a vision. The rabbi had sight that we don't have. When it says there's 10 miles of visibility, I can't see. I could see maybe the haze. Through. The Rebbe had spiritual vision that he was able to see from one end of the world to the other. They used to print, they still do, the Rebbe's talks. And they printed thoughts for the week. Many papers have to print it if they don't come out well. They use it to wrap up different things that they send in boxes. And somebody receives a box, and he sees holy writings, talks to the Rebbe, and he felt very bad. This is what he used the papers for. So he writes a letter to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, how great if somebody receives a paper, even in this manner, and he reads it, and he can share it with somebody or learn something for himself. This is what the founder of the Hasidic movement said, the Baal Shem Tov. The Shiach from Kach will come when everything, all the Hasidists will be outside everywhere. A similar story just happened in Tucson, Arizona. There's a man who goes away for the summers to Alaska and he saw a pile a papers on the floor that were going to be brought to the cemetery. And he picks up one of them called Chayeno. And he takes it with him. He comes back from his trip and he's asking Rabbi Shemto to show up there questions that come in the Maimonides. So he says to him, when did you start learning Maimonides? He says, the minute I took the Chayeno and I started to read it, I ordered it right away. Shlemy, my son, wanted me to share the following story. I was seven, eight, maybe nine, and I came to the bringing of the Rebbe with my father. And one of the things you will see soon is that people say Lachaim to the Rebbe. So I also put the smoke up, said Lachaim to the Rebbe, and I'm waiting for the Rebbe to answer me. The Rebbe tells my father, I answered it three times. They didn't know I can't see them. That's when I went to that place. <laughs> anyway, share two more stories, and then we'll go on for the rest of the problem. Rabbi Yechiel, businessman Yechiel from Antwerp, traveled a lot to different areas of the world to buy diamonds and sell diamonds as a merchant. One day his mother in New York decided to go Sunday and receive a blessing from the Rebbe. The Rebbe used to stand for hours and hours and give out blessings to people who came to the Rebbe at that time. And the Rebbe tells her, just out of the blue, your son is planning to travel. Tell him not travel where he wants home. She called up her son when she left the Rebbe. She says, where are you going? Well, I didn't want to tell you. I'm planning to go to Japan to buy uh, some uh, diamonds. It's a million dollar deal. And I know it's a little bit dangerous there. So I didn't want you to worry until I come back. Well, the Rebbe told me that I should tell you not to travel. He had a partner. And he tells the partner he's not traveling. So the partner says, fine, you're out of the deal. The guy went, he bought the merchandise, turned around to go to his car, and was shot. The same man was in New York, and he was supposed to travel back to, I think I'm but he was supposed to travel. And his brother from Dallas is trying to get a hold of him. 
and he says, finally gets a hold of him, he says, I had a dream last night, this was after the Rebbe passed away, I had a dream last night that the Rebbe told me to tell you, remember the last words I told you, follow it now. The Rebbe told him not to travel, so he was supposed to leave that day. He was supposed to take his best friend's wife to the airport and go together, and he didn't know how to tell her that he's not traveling, because she'll think he's crazy from the dream of the Rebbe. So he took her, but he was lost, he got lost. Anyway, she calls her husband as they come to the airport listening to the flight, and she's telling him what a crazy friend you have. But he was playing around and he didn't get there on time. And in the middle of the conversation, she came. The TWA flight 800 that crashed in mid that was, uh, they killed everyone in mid air. So that flight that he was supposed to take. And I will conclude with one more story. In Montreal, there's a rabbi, Fabelstuck. Many years ago, after the previous Rebbe passed away, came for the holiday of Sukkot to New York. And there's a custom that on a holiday we don't go to a cemetery. And he wanted to go to the Ohel of the previous Rebbe. So he asked the Rebbe, what should he do? Could he go Halabaya? Could he go to the intermediary days or not? Because he was going to leave back to Montreal right after Yom Tov. The Rebbe told him to follow. If you're looking at the place as a cemetery, then you don't go. But if you're looking at the place that he moved from one address to the next address, when he's with us, then you can go. And he went. My friends, the Rebbe answers us to this very day. Many thousands upon thousands of people write to the Rebbe for blessings that they need. Whether it's for livelihood, whether it's for a shiddah, whether it's for a child. People constantly write to the Rebbe. You can do the same by going to ohel.org. And the Rebbe finds his way to answer, just like we've heard in some of these stories. Let us all hope and pray that the Rebbe promised us that we are the generation that Mashiach will reveal himself, and that we should all merit to see it now. Thank you very much. Some of us in this room have met the Rebbe. Some have read about the Rebbe. Now we will forbring with the Rebbe. Before I call upon Rabbi Mendi Levertov from Chabad North Phoenix, director of the Friendship Circle of Arizona, to lead us on the journey through the Fabrenian, I'm reminded of one particular story of a Hasidic Ali, a Hasidic Fabrenian, during communist times in Russia. But there was a group of Hasidim that wanted to come to the Rebbe in New York and could not wait to finally leave Russia. The visas were hard to come by and they were not being permitted to leave. And they sat down by a Fabrenian and they poured their hearts out to each other, giving each other blessings of encouragement that we are certainly, we will see each other, but we will see the Rebbe and we will leave Russia and we will get our visas. As the night progressed, they started to believe it more and more that it's actually going to happen. So finally, towards the end of the terrain, they decided, listen, we know we're going to get our visas. Let's pretend as if we're on the plane leaving Russia. And they set up their chairs like they're on a plane, and they each sat in their chair, one behind the other, Row 25, 26, 27, whatever the rows are, the window seat, the aisle seat. And some people at the Fabrenian started laughing, what are you guys, silly? You're adults. 
play a childhood game by putting your seat to make like you're on the plane. And so six of the guys that were at the Fabrenian sat in these rows, and the other four that were there were standing around and laughing at them. Two weeks later, the six people that were sitting on the chairs as if they were flying out of Russia received their exit visas to go to the Rebbe. When we come to Fabrenian, we are experiencing something, experiencing something that is real, something that is true. I'd like to call upon our beloved of many beloved of It's 10 to 8 at night. On most nights at this time, they'd be home. Many tired from a long day of work. But tonight they are here in a large and windowless and spare room. Most of the crowd lives in the neighborhood. Some have tra traveled from afar. The younger ones stand on top of benches that are on top of tables, a precarious arrangement like a dream. They shoot the breeze, a heavy breeze, like the air on a hot Arizona summer day, whose fragrance disclose an approaching rain. Here is that thing which is the most necessary and also the least obvious. We can't see it. We can't touch it. But we most desperately need it. When the year changes, everything can seem to stay the same. When in fact, nothing stays the same. Here too, the room is the same. The people are the same. The, table are, the tables are the same. The benches are the same. The night is the same. And yet, the ear is different. The clock says it's 10 to 8 at night. It says that every night. But tonight it means that in a few minutes, the rebel will walk in and begin the Fabrenian.
Since Torah is called the Torah of Truth, it is certain that if a person will try and want, he will be able to succeed to bring peace into the world, notwithstanding the terrible dis disagreements. Because when we look with the naked eye, you could become discouraged and doubtful to where it can even discourage you from putting in the energy necessary to bring peace to the world. But when we see that the Torah, which is completely truth, was given to bring peace, then it is certain that not only is it possible to bring peace to the world, but that the peace will be a true peace, a peace that lasts not only for a certain time, but forever until the coming of Mashiach, in whose days there will be peace and tranquility. And this gives us not only the instruction to engage in the pursuit of peace, but it also encourages us and assures us that we can achieve. And then, in these last days of exile, all of us and each of us can add to the light, making the world brighter through Torah and Mitzvah until we merit the fulfillment of the promise that God himself will be the light of the world. God will illuminate the world and we will merit coming of Mashiach to Tehno immediately. Precisely because joy is expansive, 
because simcha prayers together, because joy breaks boundaries, because in a state of joy, wellsprings spread, spread outward. During the melody, people in the crowd hold up plastic cups filled with wine, waiting to say a with their other. The wellsprings spread outward. Joy breaks boundaries. And the chassid says a l'chaim with the rest.
small signal, unnoticed to most, and their stubborn melody begins. A stunning melody in its own right, but out of arranging, it carries additional meaning. Here, it is the melody of preparation before the mimer, the Hasidic discourse. At this Fabrengen, the mimer is one of a series that stretches throughout the years of Fabrengen. This series is called Basi Ligani, after a verse in Song of Songs in which Hashem says, I have come to my garden. Based on a Midrashic interpretation, the discourse explains that this verse when speaking of a garden, is referring to this world. <laughs> this is not said out of irony, but rather, as the Mimer explains, this world began as a garden, the Garden of Eden. And therefore, notwithstanding what has happened in the meantime, the world, at heart, is always a beautiful garden. For in the inner chambers of the heart, even the most distant memories remain lush and fragrant. The idea of memory runs through this series of discourses, where they are, they are all based on the last discourse delivered by the previous Slavavish Rebbe, the Rebbe's father-in-law, this holy Rebbe Rayat. And every day, on his yard, every year, sorry, on his yard site, the Rebbe would expound upon a portion of his father-in-law's discourse, each year profoundly adding to it, as if to show that even a memory if carried in the heart, continues to expand.
my sister, my bride, says in the Mimer in relation to the passing of the previous heaven. My garden is the place where the essence of the Shrina dwelt at the beginning of creation. Before the sin, the essence of the Shrina was here in this world, particularly in Gaim. And the seven generations of sin, beginning with the tree of knowledge, removed the Shrina to the seventh heaven. And then there were the seven tzaddikim, including the seventh who was special, Meshe Rabin, who brought the Shrina back from the seventh to the sixth heaven until down to earth. And particularly here on earth, it was in the building of the Mishkan in which the Shrina dwelt. The world itself was created to be a dwelling place for God, but in the dwelling place of the world, there is a dwelling place within a dwelling place. The Mishkan was built of wood called Shittim. These were the walls of the Mishkan with which the entire Mishkan was enclosed from all sides, which is an indication of the essential role of the boards. And since he refers to them as Atzei Shita, this comes to tell us something essential about bringing the Shina down to earth. And he explains that since the building of the Mishkan comes after the sins that removed the Shrina. Then there was the Shuvah and the repairing. That's why the wood has to be shitting wood. Since a person sins only when he is overcome by foolishness, that's why the repair for that is also measure for measure through holiness that is foolish. And that cancels the foolishness of the unholy. That is the content of the first part of the Bible. In the fifth part of the Bible, he explains what is holy foolishness. And foolishness consists of being above and beyond reason. It is super rational and beyond limits. And to this he quotes what he says in Tehillim. And I am given. I am devoid of knowledge. I am like an animal, but I am always with you. Since we need to be with you, with God. And as he said earlier concerning sacrifices, that that reaches to the infinity of God. Since infinity is beyond all limits, how can a person be close? to the infinite part of God, that's through not knowing God, by not being limited by reason and intelligence, but super rational. And that is the foolishness of holiness. And since a person should behave this way in general, from this we understand that this also needs to express itself in the person and this should be the primary service of the human being, the behavior and the actions of the human being reach their perfection. And that is, during the prayer, during Babylon, like the ladder that stands on earth and reaches into heaven, during the prayer, all the actions, all the thoughts and all the speech that a person performs are elevated in the time, in the prayer, until they reach to the heavens. And that's why in prayer, in Bhavani, he says in that psalm, who do I need in heaven? What do I want with earth? And as the Tzamaq Tzaddik described, what he heard from the Alta Rebbe, when the Alta Rebbe was in the ecstasy of Davani. I don't want them. I don't want your Olam Havo, your, your paradise. I just want you alone.
there are many layers of the Fabrian. The Sikha, the melody, the minor, and now the conversation. Dignitaries, visitors from abroad, a groom before his wedding, approach the Rebbe between talks. But through all the layers, one point is relentless. The Fabrengen is not about the crowd, it's about the individual. The senator aides brings greeting from the President of America and is reminded of his own capacity to affect a better world for others. A representative brings greeting from the New York governor. He is asked if he lays to fill in every day, and his young son is encouraged to stay behind. The Fabrengen, this room, packed with people, is about the individual. For ultimately, the crowd will disperse, each going their own way, leaving the individual with individual choices to make. And it's in that moment, in, a, in that intimate space of self, that we learn if the Fabrengen has made a difference, an impact. It's in that moment, and only in that moment, where the Fabrengen is but an echo that we learn if the Fabrengen lives on. Source code for the answers, or a little bit deeper. 
If the world was created by design of the Torah, then not only are the answers found in the Torah, but so are the questions. And so, when we ask, how can an individual stand up to the world, it's not only the question, it's not only the answer that comes from the Torah, the question comes from it as well. Out of a brain, one may not have found all the answers, but one's questions would never be the same. It is self-evident that what we expect of a Jew or of any human being to not be content working on self-improvement but also to work with others around him to the point where as Rambam says that through one mitzvah you can tilt the scales for yourself and for the entire world and bring salvation and blessing to the world. And that's not all. It's not enough to do one mitzvah since God gives a person years and gives him the abilities it is certain that God does not create anything, any detail in the world for naught. He didn't give it to us that we should, God forbid, neglect and not use. But every second and every opportunity needs to be used to the fullest to fulfill the purpose that God gives us, and that is to bring peace to the world, beginning with bringing Torah and Mitzvahs to the world, and literal peace. And therefore, we cannot be content with one Mitzvah, God forbid. We have to use every ability. And since the whole world is created in detail and in generality, as the Torah has details and generalities, God created the world by looking into Torah, and since it is in Torah, that's why it also appears in creation. In creation, we find that every person has to spread righteousness and justice and Yiddishkeit for Jews, beginning with himself and your immediate environment. And since we're told that God created the world for us to come to it, that a human being has to add something to God's creation. It is therefore understood that as the Gemara says in the Sanhedrin, a person was created to strive. You can't do it passively. You have to put in effort. And then you are guaranteed to succeed. You have to strive and work hard at it. not only to remain unaffected and not be influenced by the, by the behavior of the world and things that are not good, but you should become the one who will transform them and make them nicer and higher and holier. As said before, that if you want to do this and put in the effort and strive, then you have the promise that when you strive, you will succeed, and you are guaranteed success. Even though the mission consists of fixing a world that needs fixing, and here Thomas Lucas comes and asks Rabbi Akiva, how is it possible for a person to try to change something in a world created by God himself. And the answer that was given is because the world is God's garden, the garden of pleasure, as in the verse, I came to my garden. But God wants that human beings and Jews should be able to participate in the perfection of the world by working it and guarding it to add something to the world.
world that God created, leaving the world incomplete in some aspect that the human being should add and fix that which needs fixing. From this we also understand that you have to put in an appropriate effort not only to not be a victim of the, the negativity in the world, you overcome those negative forces and those difficulties and you transform the darkness into light and bitterness into sweetness from those things that apparently seem to be a, an obstacle to godliness that they themselves should become light and sweet. They should actually help make the world brighter. The vibration is about to end. After hours of Sipos, Mimer song, Mukhayim, this bright and alive space of Fabregnan will give way to the few remaining hours of night and another day. And the Fabregnan will become just a memory. But there's no tapering out Fabregnan, no surrendering to its inevitable end. Instead, well past midnight, the Rebbe begins the joyous Ufarasta, a favorite melody. Ufarasta. And you shall spread forth Yama Vakebam. The plain of the Negba, west, east, north, and south, the Rebbe rises from his chair, picking up the crowd that sings, that sings the song itself. And you shall spread forth in every direction, in every dimension, in space, in time. Fabrengan will become a memory, but what happened here won't taper out. It will spread and spread. Another Chabad house, another person putting on the fillets, another lady lighting candles, the sinos learnt, the mimer, the l'chaim, growing, growing, spreading forth. Fabrinkin will also become a memory, but it will also be more than a memory. A memory is a thing of the past, something that gets smaller with time. Fabrinkin grows, and you shall spread forth. It is said, there are some moments that are so true they are seared so deeply into the universe that even the waves of time can't wash them away. But Reagan was one of those moments. Even today, if one listens closely to the time within time, one hears the echo of a Reagan. A moment so alive it can last forever.
and he described that today we've just published a, a video, which is an unedited uh, video of his, of a, of a interview that they did with Ellie before he passed away, of course. And he writes, he tells in the story that he came to the Rebbe at the behest and encouragement of Rabbi Jacobson, who was a writer for Morgan Journal, which was a Jewish new, a Yiddish newspaper in New York. And Ellie was then working, I don't remember if it was in Vieta or not, or the forward, and that's one of the other Jewish newspapers. And they would meet each other at meetings at a press conference. And Rabbi Jacobson prevailed upon Eli to come to the Rebbe to Afabrenian. He said, come to Afabrenian. And by the way, I just want to pause for a moment and share with you, just to, to explain the difference of Afabrenian and perhaps another setting. My own paternal grandfather, my father's father, came from a background that was not exactly a Hasidic background. In fact, he was a descendant of what today they would call the descendant of uh, Ms. Nagin. Mm. <laughs> Those early opponents to Hasidism. And they had reason, they were suspicious, they were worried. And my father came to the Lubavitch, and his own father was somewhat, let's say, ambivalent about us. And they tried very hard to get him to be inspired by the Rebbe. So my father had thought and had sought that the Rebbe should take him by Yechidus, maybe should have him come for a private audience of the Rebbe. He knew that once my grandfather would be the Rebbe, that would be the end of the story. But the Rebbe had other ideas. And the Rebbe said to my father, better that you should encourage him, not yourself, but through a mutual friend, to come and be someone who my grandfather would respect, to come to a Fabrenian, where there are all types of people here. There are people who are professional, who are civil, they're older and they're young, those with beards and those without beards. And you would feel very, very comfortable. There's a lot of different eclectic learning also, different types of learning going on, mysticism, practicality, Boston Lagani, come to the garden, the world is a beautiful place. So my grandfather, he said, better to prevail upon him to come, and he did. My father, my grandfather came, and it was a very famous Fabrenian called Purim, Toshim Purim, 1958. He goes down the annals of Chabad history as the most unbelievable Fabrenian that ever encouraged everybody to have a Lachayim and was extremely, extremely, um, in a very, very uplifted way. And it was a Fabrenian one for many, many hours. Now going back to Mr. Wiesel, though, he too came to a Fabrenian and, and he described that coming to the Fabrenian, he said, I saw leadership. I saw in the Rebbe that they care for every Jew and it had an impact on him that he wanted to come back for more. He said, on the Rebbe's face, I saw that the sorrows of all the Jewish generations that lived before and after were all on the Rebbe's face. And he said, I came back, he came back to the Chiddus, and the Rebbe very, very strongly wanted him to get married, which he did not want to do, and to have children. And of course, if you fast forward, just, I just happened to realize this today, that today was his yard site, and he became, he did get married, and, and I, I'm not sure if he's at this terrain or not, I'm looking after him, I believe he was at this particular Fabrenian as well, but it certainly made an impact in his life as well. I want to share with you two small stories and then close these remarks. One story happens to be, where do we go from here? The question is, there's a lot of different ideas that go on. We're coming now, as mentioned before, a week from now, the Derebas, the Yom HaYilulah, the day marking the passing of the Rebbe. And the question is, how do we prepare for this day, and what do we do? What do we take from the Haredim? So I want to share with you, not only was the Rebbe concerned and care about the fact of every single Jew and the fact of every person in humanity and that what we have to do to create a better world, but to give you a perspective upon this, in the year 1970, there was a tremendous, tremendous, the Rebbe waged the beginning of that year, it wasn't the end of it, unfortunately, but a very, very big struggle with the definition of what is a Jew. And it was a, it was a tremendous cause of aggravation, a halakhic aggravation, and the care of the Rebbe, as you learn the talks of the Rebbe from that time, are unbelievable how much aggravation the Rebbe had from this and how personally the Rebbe took it in the most incredible way. And during the meals, of the Yomtev meals of that year, I think it was 19, it must have been 1970, but the year later it wasn't there anymore. My grandfather from Manchester, Mr. Jaffe, was very much, uh, he had asked the Rebbe before, when the first time he ever came to enjoy the Rebbe at a meal, the Rebbe asked him subsequently, no, how did you enjoy the meal? He said, terrible. He said, the Rebbe said, why? 
So they told me, so they so come to the real, it's very, very formal, no one's saying a word. There's no, they, everybody who would say a word from the Rebbe, no one had that kind of, you have to have a certain brave kite, let's just use that term, to sit in front of the Rebbe and tell stories and sing songs. It was a meal that was very, you know, it was very, very, pre very stressful time, very, very precious time. And I, I don't know if I could even handle going to the even meal myself just to be there. And you're invited, you from a few guests, you're invited to sit down by the Rebbe at a table, and it's a meal. But my grandfather said to the Rebbe that I thought maybe should be some singing, some story maybe. So the Rebbe told, that's your job from now on. I have a job for you. Okay. So the next, my grandfather took it as a personal instruction from the Rebbe, and he came to the Rebbe when, for years, you could read up all the beautiful stories, fascinating and unbelievable stories there. But this is a story that I only learned a few months ago, the, the behind the story, as it were, the rest of the story. And the story is like this. For years, I knew this part of the story. He came to the Rebbe, and he asked the Rebbe, and he said he wanted to tell a joke. The Rebbe said, okay. So he told the joke, the Rebbe said to say it in Yiddish, because he wants everybody else to understand it. So my grandfather would choose carefully a joke to say. He chose, he chose a particular joke without going into all the details of the joke. It's a very, very famous joke about a Jew who goes to three different types of rabbis to ask what the brothel that you make on shrimp is. <laughs> <laughs> and he, tell, he describes, he went to one rabbi, the rabbi said, what's a shrimp? What's a shrimp? He goes to another rabbi, the rabbi didn't want to answer the question. I don't know. And then he came to a third rabbi, and the rabbi said, what's a bracha? <laughs> my grandfather doesn't write the story that he did, the story told, but I heard it from my cousin who heard it from him. And the Rebbe got very, very serious. And the Rebbe immediately stopped my grandfather and said, I want you quickly to say a good, a good, a good word to Ignaid, say, say a good word about you quickly. And then had him say a l'chaim, the l'chaim to all of you, they should have a good word for them. And it struck me when I'm learning, at the same time, all the talks of the Rebbe, that the Rebbe's incredible anguish, literal anguish that the Rebbe had from a particular movement that was eroding, and it's, that was eroding the very essence of what is a Jew, and yet the Rebbe could not hear that another Jew should be described upon in a way, it doesn't matter who the Jew is, a per, an individual Jew that a Jew who doesn't know what a bracha is. And it, there's a letter actually from the Rebbe to a, to, the, to a person who asked him, and it's also a published letter in English, but the Rebbe asked, he was asked about a, the, Kash, the Liverpool Kashas Commission. Believe it or not, there was another export from, from Liverpool, England, and it had to do with the Kashas Commission. So if you haven't heard of Liverpool, there were other things that happened in Liverpool in addition to some very famous uh, joyous singers. And they asked, the Liverpool Cautious Commission in 1961 declared that from this point and on, they were not going to provide kosher food to any event that would be catered by anything but an orthodox shul. So if you had a person that was celebrating their wedding or bar mitzvah, the Cautious Commission said that we are not going to allow our caterers to cater at this event, at these events. And this person wrote to the Rebbe and asked the Rebbe for his opinion. The Rebbe was very reluctant to give an opinion when he said there were many other Rabbanim, many other uh, leading halachic authorities in England who should weigh in on this matter. But the Rebbe said, I'll weigh in on one, one concept of it. He said that, look, if it's about Jews who are personally making their own simcha, not a public event put on by a temple or by some other organization, but a personal wedding or a mitzvah, then how can you deny another Jew this mitzvah? How can you deny another Jew the mitzvah of having kosher? And in other words, what I'm getting at over here is that each and every one of us should realize that we have the ability to take the Rebbe's own instructions and the time of the Rebbe called his campaign, his 10-point campaign, to inspire one and another and another and another Jew and another Jew and another, if it's not a Jew, then another Ben Noach, to encourage them to realize that, as was said in the Fabrenian of that Fabrenian of Yud Shabbat of 1975, Bossi Lugani, come to, I come to my garden, it's Hashem's garden. The way you do it is by encouraging and realizing that truth to be told is that every single Jew has a neshama within them that is just waiting for someone to encourage them and to believe in them. And to have that belief in them that they too should be able to do another mitzvah. And I will conclude 
with a beautiful story that is told by Mr. Yehuda Avner, blessed memory. He was the uh, um, advisor, diplomat, speechwriter for many, many of the Israeli prime ministers. He only passed away, I think, three years ago. And he describes, and it was 40 years ago this July, Menachem Begin, the then prime minister of Israel, came to visit the Rebbe, among other Jewish leaders that he came to visit before he went to see Mr. Carter, who was then president. It was the first visit by Mr. Begin to the American president at that time. And he stopped by the Rebbe. And when he was in by private audience by, with the Rebbe, so afterwards, he was going off to Washington from there on, and he said to the Rebbe, I will send back one of my advisors to give you a report of the talks, the early talks that took place, that, that were going to take place in Washington. And so about two or three weeks later, Mr. Avner, who was an advisor to, the, to Mr. Begin, came back to be with the Rebbe in a private audience. He ended up being for about three hours in the Yichidus. And at some point during this audience, towards the end, somehow the conversation turned. In addition to all the stuff about Israel and about the geopolitical situation, about the talks in Washington, about the Arabs, all the wonderful things, the Rebbe, at some point, the conversation turned to the role of the Rebbe. And the Rebbe looked for an analogy to give him about the way he saw his role. In other words, the way the Rebbe perceived his own role as Rebbe. And he said, look, you have a candle. A candle is just a glob of wax. What distinguishes the wax from just any other piece of wax is the fact that you have a wick inside the candle. But a wick in the candle is also not enough because it can just stand there and be an ornament on the wall or on a shelf. What makes a candle a candle is when you take a match and you light the wick then you would have the beautiful candle, the beautiful wick, the candle comes what it was meant to be. And the letter said that the wax is the body, and the wick is the neshama, is the soul. My job, said the letter, is to try to inspire others that they too should have this fire in their, this wax to create this synthesis, where now you have not just a candle, but you have a candle with a beautiful flame on it as well. And it was at that point that Mr. Avner had to take his leave. There was already incessant ringing going on by the Rebbe's secretary. It's time to, you know, time to call it a night. So he got up, the Rebbe got up with him to walk into the door, but he had one last question for the Rebbe. And he said to the Rebbe, he asked the Rebbe, he said, it's the Rebbe, and you have lit my candle. And the Rebbe straight away said, no, but I have given you a match. And now you can take this match and light your own candle. And these words, in essence, is the preparation for people Thomas that each of us has a match, and each of us must find what that match is, and strike this match and bring a beautiful flame to our own candle. And when we do this together, we'll merit the coming of Mashiach, where the Jewish people will be a real candle that will be a flame, and with security and happiness. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I want to thank Bernie for all the refreshments. I greatly appreciate it. And there will be a, a minute for Meyer to follow in uh, two minutes. Thank you very much.